It's, but it's working again, great. So the next presentation is uh, actually a group presentation which had originally uh, three authors, and I think the authorship is still the three of you, but uh, only two of them managed to come here. So um, the three authors are uh, Tatiana Andreovitz, Angeliki Kita, and Danai Theodoraki. But sadly, Angeliki had to uh, cancel. Uh, the title is Take a Walk on the Wild Side in Bronze Age Macedonia. And um, yes, I can hand you the microphone. Are you speaking alone, or do you have to trade in between? Uh, I will speak alone, and we'll answer the questions together. Great. Okay. Uh, I leave this here, right? Yeah. And then you can just pin it. Oh, sorry. 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 I think. Sorry. I, I didn't break it. I broke it. <laughs> I broke it. I oh, know it's working. If it's green, it's okay. Sorry. Don't worry. So like this. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. So the first uh, question you were asked when you call the hotline for IT support is, have you plugged it in? <laughs> the answer okay. is no, we didn't. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, can we dim the light? Uh, should I stop? Uh, we're trying to dim the lights a bit. No. Oh. no. No. Like gently, 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 gently. With love. Oh. It's like touching me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, bravo. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having us here. And now we will take you a bit further to the north. So, um, the subject of this presentation is the relationship of people with their natural environment during the Bronze Age in the region of Macedonia. Archaeological discussion on this relationship between humans and nature, as far as it concerns the southern Aegean, and particularly Crete and the Peloponnese, focuses mainly on the gendered representation of hunting episodes linked with the legitimation of the social status of elite groups in the emergence of complex social organization. In our current presentation, we chose to focus our overview on Macedonia, which is traditionally considered by Aegean prehistorians to belong to the so-called periphery uh, of the center, that is the area where complex palatial societies uh, were developed and where were not developed. Ah, yes, and where archaeological evidence offers an insight into everyday practices. In this talk, we will attempt to investigate the wild environment. Um, and explore how people are entangled uh, with it in the Bronze Age. That is at a time when agriculture and farming were well-established uh, subsistence strategies in the local communities of the Northern Aegean. The predominant Western concept perceives the environment as alienated, distant, and unfamiliar. And therefore, in order for people to achieve its habitation, it has to be humanized. For Binford, culture was the extrasomatic means for human adaptation to its natural and social surroundings. According to this, the environment is treated as an exterior element that people need to approach and appropriate through a series of events. In this presentation, however, we chose to perceive uh, the environment not as an external object, but as a process through which a person par participates in it actively and therefore, this entanglement with space and time produces meaning. Space is transformed into place through human intervention. For this reason, the environment is signified by the human presence and not the opposite, a presence that is physical but also active. 
The daily practices such as habitation, movement in space, daily and spatial moments, productive and non-productive activities, ritual and ceremonial acts and others, constitute a way of everyday entanglement with the environment through which the world is actively perceived, according to Bourdieu. <coughs> in this concept, uh, context, we can also understand the relation between farming societies and the wild environment. In this relationship, we should not project our modern perception of wildlife, wildlife <laughs> as something external and alienated from civilization. On the contrary, the archaeological data and activities such as hunting and fishing, harvesting of fruits and shells, procurement of raw materials, or even non-productive activities, which suggest that this contact with the natural environment was daily and substantial for the societies of the Bronze Age. Besides, in pre-modern societies, a great part of everyday life constantly exceeded the boundaries of the settlement that, as they are perceived today based on the architectural remains and were expanded in a wide range of different surrounding envi uh, environments. At the same time, practices such as hunting or the procurement of raw materials do not reflect the normality of everyday life. The movement in space, geographical and symbolic, creates a whole different reality from the cyclical measurement of time and landscape shaping. The time and energy that the departure from the settlement demands raises a question such as which part of the community participated in these activities? Were all the members of the group equally involved in these activities, or was there a social and symbolic field that reproduced and legitimated distinctions based on social status, gender, or age? <clears throat> For example, according to the ethnographic record, seashell gathering is often described as a recreational activity where the members of the community have fun or gossip while hunting is often part of initiation rituals and plays an important role in the construction of male identity. After this brief theoretical introduction, we're going to continue to the presentation of the data from the case study area. Archaeological evidence from Macedonia is, sig is significant in order to understand this everyday involvement of prehistoric people with their environment. First, we would like to draw your attention to the fragmentary character of information, which come primarily, primarily from preliminary reports of rescue excavations, although a significant body of data will be provided by efficiently published, uh, published sites, that is the Saloniki and Asiro's Tumba, Arhodiko, Mandalo, Ayus Mamas and Castanas in central Macedonia, and Sitagri and Dikilitash in eastern Macedonia. During the Bronze Age, in central Macedonia in particular, settlements formed steep-sided and highly visible mounds in the type of the so-called tells or tumbas in Greek. Their form and height are the result of the length of their occupation and suggest a tendency to permanence and strong links of the humans with their domestic space. Mud brick building material accumulated and formed the tell type of settlements as the inhabitants were repeatedly rebuilding the houses on top of the older ones by reusing often uh, earlier walls. Uh, with regard to the social organization of the site during the early phases of the Bronze Age, that is uh, 3002 to 2000 BC, a homogeneity is reflected in the settlements. Autonomous individual households that do not show signs of settlement hierarchization, characterize a communal organization, as it is attested by the architectural evidence and spatial organization, as well as by the variety of food preparation, cooking, and food storing installations within the houses. Concerning the MBA, the existing evi evidence is very sparse. In Agios Mama, single room, uh, structures of the early Bronze Age were replaced in the MBA by complex uh, post-framed structures, thus posing the question what these architectural changes may reflect. Um, during the LBA, there is an increase in the number of settlements. Four uh, late Bronze Age sites 
that is Asiros, Kastanas, the Saloniki tomb by Nagios Mamas, have been extensively excavated and adequately published and are five, uh, four to five kilometers away from each other. During this period, large complex buildings appear, as well as defending and uh, terracing walls, suggesting the emergence of social inequalities among communities. The LBA was a period of intensive social and, and cultural activities. This led to a rearrangement of human relations in the communities. As far as the subsistence is concerned, people were exploiting their immediate environment and a small scale mixed economy provided by the archaeobotanical and archaeozoological data in sites such as the Saloniki and Nazarus Tumba appears to be practiced. The environment in Bronze Age Macedonia was different, of course, than that it is today. Palynological analysis on lake deposits from northern Greece confirms that dense forest vegetation, uh, such as oak, plane trees, walnut trees, um, etc., of the mountains in Macedonia during the Bronze Age. As far as the plain of the Saloniki is concerned, around 4000 BC, it was occupied by a large marine gulf. Around 2700, this bay started to be infilled by terrestrial uh, deposits provided mainly by the Aliakmon and Axios rivers. Thus, the gulf began gradually to transform into natural dams and lagoons. As a result, practice environments were created <coughs> around the bay. As far as the plant uh, residues are concerned, the largest frequency belongs to domesticated and cultivated species, mainly cereals and pulses. However, a significant amount constitutes of wild plant species, uh, such as fruits and tree crops, oil and aromatic plants, although much of the quality of the information depends heavily on sampling and the state of preservation. The wild species of fruits found in settlements of Macedonia during the Bronze Age include figs, which were found in the largest quantity, cranberries, mainly the early Bronze Age, sloes, pears, acorn, blackberries, elder, and strawberries found in the settlement of Castanas. Another category of wild species are the oil and aromatic plants. In Bronze Age Macedonia, the most important species are Camelina sativa, Lelemantia, flax, opium puppy, and mustard. The significant amount of these species found in most of the settlements confirms that they were part of the daily diet of humans. However, it seems that they had a complementary um, role in the people's diet next to the cereals and pulses, which are found in much larger quantities. In some cases, as in the settlement of early Bronze Age Mandalo, flax, acorn, and raspberries were found in storage pits alongside with other domesticated species. It is worth mentioning that the high concentration of grape pimps in early Bronze Age Dekilitash and Sitagri, could be an indication of winemaking. Although it is extremely difficult to identify whether the wine was made from wild or domesticated species. Furthermore, chemical analysis uh, of the content of traditional handmade pottery imitating Mycenaean pottery from the Saloniki Tumba indicate the existence of oil production in the form of perfumes and ointments before intense interaction with the Mycenaean culture. The association of some of the oil containers with burial contexts suggests its possible relation with a symbolic and or ceremonial sphere. Wild animals ended up in the settlements as hunted, uh, hunting products. These animals were important not only for their meat, but also for their bones, fur, fat, and skin. Although domestic animals are far more important than wild animals, still aurochs, badgers, beavers, wild swine, brown bears, bastards, wild cats, chamois, fallow deer, red deer, roe deer, foxes, geese, hares, hedgehogs, small rats, quail, turtles, and lions are present in most of the settlements during the Bronze Age. In early Bronze Age, it agree, and Castanas, uh, and NBA, sorry, Castanas, the inhabitants manage wild resources daily, not only for their meat. Bones from wild animals were used as raw materials uh, for tools. Lion bones have also been detected 
as we mentioned, in LBA Thessaloniki and Kastanas Tumba. According to zoo archaeologists, there are no indications of conception suggesting that these bones could be perceived as prestige objects. Hunting, therefore, could attribute to these wild products an economic and symbolic value. Representation of wild fauna on tools provides another aspect of the high symbolic value of hunting to the ideology of the Br Bronze Age cosmos in northern Greece. It doesn't work. Okay. Yes. <laughs> the soft axe uh, from early Bronze Age, it agree, is such an example as you see uh, here. Hunting for prehistoric people was not just another way of survival. Hunting as well as feasting had their own role in the social arena through the negotiation and legitimation of social identities. Hunting could be a way of escaping from ordinary time and space through which people went in the forest and interacted with animals. Also, it is a meaningful body experience connected with feelings such as fear and awe. Prehistoric inhabitants showed an active interest in exploiting the marine ecosystems. The inhabitants of Bronze Age Macedonia collected mollusks as food as well as raw materials. Their kalmalacological evidence demonstrates that the majority of the settlements in central Macedonia were collecting mollusks on a large scale that were readily available in their surroundings. Shells were also being collected on a smaller scale or occasionally by the inhabitants of the other settlements in northern Greece. During the early Bronze Age, people mainly exploited uh, shallow brackish waters and collected sea glaucum, also known as the uh, lagoon cockle, following the pre-existing Neolithic tradition. The collecting practices were specialized and aimed at a single species. On the other hand, during the Middle Bronze Age, exploitation at spe uh, aimed at species living in marine environments, that is, mainly hexaplex trunculus. During the LBA, collection became more diversified and hexaplex truculum, um, Cerastoder maglaucum, and Carinthium vulgatum were collected. Even though the coastal zone continued to be the main source of exploitation, a more intense exploitation of the deeper sea zones can be deducted. The selection of species depended on the immediate environment surrounding its settlement. Even though people focus on the lagoon cockle, a difference can be noted in the secondary species that each settlement chose, thus reflecting not only different coastal environmental structures, but also possibly different diets and dietary notions. Purple shells were also gathered and used for the extraction of uh, purple dye during the Middle Bronze Age, and the late Bronze Age in Thessaloniki tomb by Nagios Mamas. Uh, an example is here. Uh, the dye could afterwards uh, be used for the dyeing of textiles, textiles and other objects. The wild animal uh, element sorry, becomes once again in this manner part of the material culture, although its visibility is rather elusive for archaeologists. As far as the archaeology archaeological evidence is concerned, during the early Bronze Age, a large variety of fish is attested, comparing to the Neolithic, and a large variety of ecosystems are being exploited. Common species collected are different kinds of rays and sharks. Also, the existing, uh, existence of pelagic fish of the Scombridae family, like little tuna, bluefin tuna, etc., are not rare. For example, the archaeological data from early Bronze Age Archodico, Archodico is rich, showing that all the surrounding marine waters were being exploited. Moreover, towards the uh, Middle Bronze Age and the Late Bronze Age, there is a shift from brackish waters to marine environments, uh, and thus a more intense focus uh, towards the sea. sea. The quantities are, are large, and it seems that the exploitation of uh, marine resources is not specialized and is more intense in the coastal settlements. On the contrary, the mainland settlements were focused on fishing specific species that were readily available. For example, in uh, Middle Bronze Age and Late Bronze Age Thessaloniki Tumba, there is a generalized exploitation of all available uh, environments, while there was also an increasing interest in the rivers. 
On the other hand, in the site of Castana, situated on the Axios rivers, the marine element exploitation was almost absent, while the brackish and freshwater environments were more dominant. It is evident that the fishing and collecting, uh, collecting activities were important for the prehistoric communities. However, they did not simply constitute mere survival strategies. Archaeological evidence reveals an ongoing uh, relation and interaction with the marine environment. Another eth ethnographic example that strengthens the proposed argument and illustrates the way in which nature is embedded in the material culture and people's uh, belief systems is that of a traditional boat from Mudanya. This boat was adorned with the marine plant of Posidonia, a plant that forms underwater meadows crucial for the marine ecosystem and is highly esteemed by fishermen. Based on the above observations, we can understand that prehistoric inhabitants of Bronze Age Macedonia were actively involved with nature through practices that were not strictly limited to the architectural boundaries of the settlements. The world for the uh, inhabitants of Bronze Age Macedonia consisted of the places where the activities were held in and out of their domestic space. The wild sphere was therefore, therefore was embedded in the cultural choices of the local communities and was embodied in their social practices as well as in the, their material culture. This involvement of people with the wild surroundings was part of a dialectic relation which constructed both space and time. This entanglement could have an impact in the way that people perceived and negotiating, uh, negotiated their individual and collective identity and formed their cosmologies and ideologies that constructed uh, Bronze Age societies. According to a phenomenological, phenomenological yes, approach, the world is not a matter of construction but a matter of participation. Not a matter of thinking about the world, but thinking in the world. And that's it. Thank you. OK. So Tatiana is also here to answer together okay, your so questions. Thank you very much for your really structured presentation and for broadening our understanding of borders between habitation and nature. Uh, I would like to ask anyone to pose a question. Yeah, uh, we didn't, uh, you're right, of course, and there's a whole discussion on seasonality, and uh, it's very interesting. And yes, we can say a lot of things on that. <laughs> and also we're, we're basing you know, in ethnographic records, but um, yes, it's uh, in fashion a bit now. So in some, uh, to, try, to try and trace this seasonality that you mentioned. And you can also do that, I think, with isotope analysis. Yes. 
Yes. Okay, one thing is the uh, isotope analysis on humans, so to try to trace their diet. That's yeah, one thing. Uh, yeah. uh, I think, yes, they have, but I can't tell you an example. But also, they have done it uh, on fish bones to trace that. Mm. And on shells too, but I can't tell your reference exactly. But I, I think it's an open question. It's there. Uh, researchers are looking into it. Any more questions? Okay. Well, I guess uh, since time has proceeded a little bit, we can go on to the next presentation and we'll gladly discuss things with you over dinner, mm -hmm. um, which kind of touches your topic as well. So. <laughs>